Welcome! I am Emir, and let us look back in hindsight. All English episode today, because for once, I will not be covering Philippine media. When I was in college, my father told me, Stop watching cartoons. You're not a child anymore. I have a student in my college who is immature because he always watched cartoons. Can't even get a date. For the longest time, I followed him. There was a stigma in the household against watching cartoons. I stopped watching cable, Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, Disney Channel. I even stayed away from classic animated movies that I grew up with, mostly films from the Disney Renaissance. Even today, when my dad is not around, the stigma prevails. I'd rather watch YouTube videos than, say, Spongebob or... I'm not proud of this one. Teen Titans Go! Then I saw Waking Sleeping Beauty, a documentary about the making of the first half of the Disney Renaissance. The Little Mermaid, The Rescuers Down Under, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, and The Lion King. This documentary recounted and featured the struggles that the Disney Animation Studio went through in its dark age, ultimately leading to its rebirth and its towering influence over my childhood and millions of others, perhaps even a generation. Certainly, the themes of the documentary, power struggles, late night and early morning shifts, artistic differences, and conflicts, these are not childish themes. And then, I discovered many channels on YouTube, Joe the Disney Guy, Phantom Strider, Steve Reviews, Saber Spark, Film Theory, Pie Guy Rules, I Hate Everything, Alpha J Show, Nintendo, Rebel Taxi, Shea Frillias, Nerdstalgic, Dream Sounds, Sideways, all of these channels talk about animation, the story, the characters, the music, what works, what doesn't work, what needs to be changed, expanding the universe, thinking about what-if scenarios. These are not childish themes. And the owners of these YouTube channels are not children. Plus, my sister has become an anime fan. And anime is essentially Japanese animation or Asian animation. I'm not sure. I'm not an expert on that. So to my father, I say... <sighs> ha! Anyway, here are my top 10 Disney songs. Decided to include everything Disney on this list. And not just the animated movies. Why? Well, why not? 10. I'm not fond of Daddy Issues movies. You know where the father, or sometimes the mother, imposes his or her own worldview and dreams upon the protagonist. Even Disney has its own Daddy Issues movies. Disney even turned one of its classic characters, a comic relief, a foil, a literal goof, into a dad. Why? Goofy becoming a dad did not start with a movie but with a TV show called Goof Through from the 90s, which I used to watch as a kid. The parent-child relationship between Goofy and Max continues with a Goofy movie, which is then followed up by an extremely Goofy movie. In both movies, Goofy comes to grips with the reality that his son Max is growing up. The last movie has Goofy coming back to school to finish his college degree at the same college where Max is enrolled, much to Max's embarrassment, who is trying to be his own person. It's a fun movie. Go watch it. Goofy finally learns to let go. He breaks the news that he got an on-campus job to stay close to Max before saying that he was only joking. And then Goofy and his girlfriend, Sylvia, the librarian in the movie, drive into the sunset. 
as the credits roll, this song plays. And it's all right, and it's coming on, we gotta get it right, back to where we started from. Love is good, love is love, can be strong, we gotta get it right, back to where we started from. Ooh, ooh, ooh. come on baby. Dun, 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 dun. Ooh, ooh. The an extremely goofy movie version of Right Back Where We Started From is a cover or a remake of British singer Maxine Nightingale's version from 1975 or 76. Meanwhile, Cleopatra is also British, a band composed of the Higgins sisters. I don't know why Disney chose a song from the 70s. Was it because Goofy was originally in college in the 70s? There was a disco scene in the film, but why disco? Was there a 70s revival going on by the late 90s? The lyrics of the Cleopatra version are almost the same as the original, except that the first verse, which was also the chorus, was replaced. Turn, 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 ooh, yeah, turn, 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 we can. Get it right back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, baby. I prefer the Cleopatra intro because it avoids overplaying the chorus. Since the chorus is the sticking point, or earworm of any song, it must walk a tightrope of balancing catchiness and overplay. True, the Cleopatra version plays the chorus four times, but Cleopatra's use of the chorus is evenly distributed. After the first verse, after the second verse, and twice after the musical interlude, as a way to end the song. Starting any song with the chorus, just like Maxine Nightingale's version, is unusual. As for the rest of the lyrics, the singer assures the listener that the promises made when they first met remain. No one will replace the listener in the singer's heart. The singer would do his or her best to make sure that the pain caused by his or her words to the listener would not linger. The singer would put back the smile on the listener's face. I am so tired of serenades making these same promises to the point where they sound insincere. In contrast, right back where we started from is a breath of fresh air. Rather than trying to win someone over, it is an affirmation of love. The song looks backward in time in the quest to move forward. For this reason, I like this song. The lyrics don't matter in the context of an extremely goofy movie though, because Disney just decided to include it in the end credits. A shame. So, I'm not sure if this remake was necessary, since Disney just placed the song at the end credits. Disney can certainly afford to pay for the rights to use the original song. Maxine Nightingale's version is faster and more energetic compared to the Cleopatra version. But I still do like the Cleopatra version well enough to merit its inclusion in this list. Even if it is slower than the original, it's still a bop and fun to listen to. I can't help but at least tap my feet when this song plays. The song may be older than me, at least the original is, but it makes me feel young. Come on, let's dance. Also, I like seeing Goofy, Max, and the rest of the characters dance to right back where we started from during the end credits of an extremely goofy movie. Even the Beret Girl dances to it. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why did I point out the Berry girl? Does she have an important role to play in the movie? 
I think that question can be answered by the fact that she does not have a name. But my sister, an expert in all things an extremely goofy movie, has something to say about the Berry Girl. Also, my sister wants a spoken word poetry coffee shop in her campus. But that's not coming anytime soon. Oh well, at least she still has this movie. 9. Let's go back to the early 2000s, which was not the best time for Disney. Some movies from that era have seen attention nowadays, either because they are overlooked gems or downright turns. One movie from that era I don't hear being talked about as much is a little movie called Brother Bear. What? You don't remember Brother Bear? Have you seen Brother Bear? Do you even know that this movie exists? Alright, let me fill you in. Brother Bear is the story of a human named Kenai who the spirits transform into a bear. He meets a bear cub named Koda, who is separated from his mom after an encounter with humans. Together, they go to the place where the lights touch the earth so that Kenai could become human again. I hope I did not spoil too much of the movie. Go check it out. Brother Bear is not painful on the eyes and is not as boring as home on the range. Nor is it mean-spirited like Chicken Little. But it's not a good sign if this film is not well remembered. You know what else Disney did in the 2000s? Sequels. Direct-to-DVD sequels. These sequels were either the first episode of a television show, episodes of a cancelled animated show that were cobbled together to form a movie or rehashes of the first film. Some of these are not even sequels but midquels or prequels. Of course, many of these sequels did not live up to the expectations set by the first film. Sounds familiar? But one sequel stood out for me. A sequel to a movie little remembered and little talked about. What? I have a soft spot for movies where childhood friends fall in love and make sacrifices because of that love. I hope I did not spoil the movie too much for you. Go check it out too. In fact, you can check out the second movie first without even watching the first movie. Brother Bear 2 also has a good soundtrack. The songs here bring a wide array of emotions for me, something that Phil Collins will never be able to do. Most of the tunes are slow though, so for this list, I chose the fastest one. Welcome, magic! Welcome, sweet sunray! Love is no secret, Look all around you, welcome to this day. Welcome to this day celebrates the coming of a brand new day. The message of the song is simple. Embrace the magic in waking up. Here's another opportunity to speak your voice, to make hopefully the right choices, and to grow. This song touches me because it drives me as I go through every challenge that life throws. Despite the mistakes I make today, tomorrow will always be a fresh start. I also like the tune of the song. It is appropriate for the empowerment theme. You won't wake up to a drowning downbeat tune, right? I'd rather stay in bed than get up. The use of this song in Brother Bear 2 is also thematically appropriate. Welcome to this day opens the movie, which is set in the beginning of spring. After a winter-long hibernation, bears wake up, rivers thaw, salmon jump, and romances bloom. The moose call it spring fever. 
You need energy to start the day? Listen to Welcome to This Day.